There is no question that something is here. Lurking. Somewhere in the darkened corners. But how will we ever find out what it is? We need to look. Always. And never stop. No matter what stands in our way. No matter what others may think. Explore the darkness. Shine light into it. Join the red strings and the silver threads. Everything is connected. Somehow. I am Mark L. Watson. This is Peer Beyond the Veil. People often ask me, how, how do I get interested in cryptozoology? And I always give them the same answer, the same three word answer, classic Doctor Who. I grew up watching Doctor Who with John Pertwee and, and then Tom Baker. And John Pertwee spent a lot of his time on Earth. So everything he faced was immediate. It wasn't on some distant planet. It was in your own sort of figurative backyard. So he had stories about giant mutant maggots crawling out of slag heaps in whales and uh, intelligent humanoid dinosaurs these lovecraftian entities and it was very dark it was as much about horror as it is as it was about science fiction there's one story telling for one chain that had uh, um opium addicts prostitutes and giant rats gnawing people's legs off down victorian sewers but that's what i've got interest interested uh, got me interested in weird creatures and i was also a huge fan of david attenborough uh, with Life on Earth, and the series he did called uh, Fabulous Animals, which has never been repeated and never been released on DVD. And this was about uh, strange creatures uh, and monsters from mythology and, and um, cryptozoology and things like that. And it utterly fascinated me. And when I, I left school, I became a zookeeper uh, in a place called Plycrosser in the West Midlands. I became a, the reptile keeper there. And... After a few years, I found this little magazine called Animals and Men, and it was on sale uh, to the now sadly defunct Potter's Museum of Curiosity on Bodmin Moor. Uh, it was on sale, and it was about cryptozoology, and it was published by this outfit called the, the Centre for Fourteen Zoology. So I contacted them, and I was living in Yorkshire at the time, um, started writing articles for them, became their Yorkshire representative, and I went down to visit. Uh, it was run by a guy called John Downs. I went down to visit him, and he said, come on down, and... Um, be a uh, you know our zoological director as our population grows exponentially as we crowd ourselves out of the cities out onto the land building up the world around us and squeezing everything else out it's easy to overlook the fact that we humans make up only a tiny tiny fraction of the planet's life there are around 7.8 billion of us crammed onto this rock but there are also 18 billion domestic chickens, 500 trillion Antarctic krill, and a quadrillion ants. There are an estimated 8.7 million different species of living creature on the planet, yet despite all this, and almost unbelievably so, scientists estimate that 86% of land creatures on our planet are yet to be discovered, and 91% of ocean creatures. So really, despite our knowledge of over 8 million of them, we actually hardly know many of them at all. Scientists discover many of them each year, and they're not all tiny bugs and sea worms. There are big lizards, monkeys and lemurs and sloths, dolphins and rays and species of deer, and in 2010 a new species of clouded leopard. All of them existed in our world, and we mostly had no idea they were there. Some of these creatures appear to us by chance. They show when we were looking for something different, in places we didn't expect. Others are searched for more intentionally. Perhaps there existed stories or tales of them from remote villages, or we found traces of evidence from something we didn't know. Many of them take years and years of painstaking research to finally discover Teams of specialists go into the wild season after season, 
chasing down leads and reviewing hundreds of thousands of images from trail cameras in the hope of catching a glimpse of the elusive beasts. Not too long ago, a team of specialists knew that Canadian black bears had been coming south over the border and making homes around the forests of the Pacific Northwest. Hare and scat was very occasionally found, but it took the team of highly trained trackers and experts more than five years to actually see them for the first time. So even the giants, seemingly under our noses, sometimes prove too elusive to catch. Zoological journalist and author Richard Freeman has dedicated his entire life to tracking down some of the most elusive creatures that may or may not share the planet with us. As a cryptozoologist, Richard has penned eight books and holds the role of zoological director for the Centre for Fortean Zoology. His expedition to some of the most remote places on this planet in search of cryptids like the Yeti, the Orang Pendek and the Almasti, and has made huge strides in his pursuit of the once presumed extinct Tasmanian wolf. Richard joins me tonight to discuss his work and to tell us why we may not have to try that hard to peer beyond the veil. Places like Mongolia and Tasmania and um, Sumatra and places, those, those really are some far-flung places indeed. The key to it is, is getting the correct guide. You've got to find a good guide who's trustworthy, and who knows the area and knows local people. And when you can do that, they can set up the, the groundwork for you. So you, you can hit the ground running. They can find witnesses, find places to, to stop, find places to get equipment. That's the whole key to it all. For example, when we did Diana to look for the giant anaconda, there was a guy called Damon Corey who's actually a um, Eagle Clan Arawak chief, and we contacted him, and he organised stuff for us, and he was our guide, he was great. In Sumatra, we had a chap called Sahar Dimas, and we got him uh, through Gedi Marta, an English woman who lives over there and works for the, um, uh, the Parks Department. So it's, uh, that's the thing to do. You need to get a good, um, a good, a, a good guy. And the, the, the main pain in the backside about it is the travel, because somewhere like Tasmania, it can take up over a day to get there. And I was 31 hours the last time I went. Um, you know, so many changes uh, from plane to plane in different places, because there's no direct route. And that's the only part of expeditions that worry me. People say, oh, don't get worried on these expeditions. It's dangerous, aren't you? scared of being attacked or eaten or um, getting terrible diseases. And I said, no, the only thing that worries me is, is getting there, it's a flight. One of, one of the most fascinating animal, which is now cryptozoological, but obviously we, we obviously know exists, as you said, the Tasmanian wolf, the thylacine. There have been, there seem to be an increasing amount of reports, photos, videos, some from urban settings, um, that seem to suggest that it's hence your two, three, four expeditions that you've you've made out there um, in quite recent years. What evidence do you do you have for that? Have you found something that you you find less questionable than maybe some of the you know the things you might spot on YouTube? Well, I've uh, I've spoken to witnesses in Tasmania who've got no reason to lie, and in fact, they they only opened up to me when I promised not to reveal exactly where these sightings were because they want to protect the animal. But I've, I've talked to an old ex-logger who saw one of these things back in the 50s and his son had seen one just a few years back. Uh, I talked to a government licensed shooter who goes out and keeps the feral cats down and he's seen it twice uh, in the forest of Tasmania. And I think I may have actually smelled the animal People who saw it during its official time of existence, some of the old um, trappers and hunters and stuff, they had been in the Boer War in South Africa and they said that the scent of the, the thylacine is very similar to the scent of the, the striped hyena. I was in a remote area of Tasmania once going along a trail and I got this smell. I used to be a zookeeper, I know what a hyena smells like. I got this smell exactly like the smell of a hyena. And it was just in this one area, almost as if whatever made the smell had been there, you know, just seconds before. And um, you could pass through this area. Uh, it was only a few metres across where you could get the smell. Set up a camera trap there, but 
didn't t- didn't photograph anything. I mean, was that a, a Tasmanian wolf? I don't know. But whatever left that smell smelled awfully like um, a striped hyena. And there are no other creatures that could remotely fit the bill, other than a feral dog or a feral cat in Tasmania. You know, if you're looking at that on, on the African continent or something, then you could be thinking, well, it could be one of many, many, many different things. Um, but not on not on Tasmania. Obviously, it's been separated as an island from the mainland for, you tell me, a, a long time. The, the population of animals there is fairly isolated. And if you look at the makeup of the animal, it's certainly, if you get a good view of it, it's, it's not a dog and it's not a cat. Yeah, and these are seasoned bushmen who they know what they're talking about. And there was a, uh, a, a guy called Professor Henry, Henry Nix. Um, I think he was at Melbourne University of memory serves. He developed a computer program called BioClin. And this was a research aid for zoologists. And what you do is program everything you know about a certain geographical region into this computer this program and then you would put in data about your target species so for example if you wanted to find white rhinos in Botswana it would match the known habits of the animal up with the geographical range and tell you the best place to see white rhinos in Botswana and as an exercise he tried this with the Tasmanian wolf in Tasmania and he said that there was something like a 98% match up between where the computer system, the computer program rather, was predicting thylacines should be if they were still around, and where they were actually being reported from. So that convinced him they were still there. It's just a computer program that has no vested interest. But the data he was getting matched up exactly, or 98%, to, to where the biotrim program predicted thylacines should be if they were still in Tasmania. Is there anything else when I, you know, I asked the question, have you found any evidence that you would find unfashionable? Have, have on any of the other expeditions found something that you, you know, a piece of evidence for one of these cryptids that you find beyond question um, that would, in your mind, pr- proof's the wrong word because you would need more than a single piece of evidence for proof of the existence of a creature. But have you found anything that, that solidifies in your mind that some of these things are more than just myth? Well, the Orang Pendek uh, of Sumatra, an upright walking ape, lives on the forest floor, stands on two legs like a man, very powerfully built, but quite short, um, between three to five feet tall, dark hair, strikingly human-looking face. Um, I've been on the trail of this animal ooh, um, five times now, I think that's a uh, Sumatra five times looking for it. Uh, I found handprints and footprints of the creature. And uh, I used to work with, with apes. When I was a zookeeper, I specialised in reptiles, crocodiles, alligators, and so on. But I worked with a hell of a lot of apes as well, so I'm familiar with their tracks in all kinds of mediums. Uh, the tracks of the Orang Pendek show a very human like broad heel, four toes at the front, and then uh, the hallux or big toe offset and semi prehensile, obviously adapted for walking on the ground, but still very good for climbing. Most apes, when you look at their, their heels, they've got quite narrow heels. This is quite different. The handprint is is very like that of a small gorilla, thick sausage-like fingers, um, a thumb that looks very opposable. Pardon me, very opposable. But above and beyond that, we found hair, and this hair was studied by Lars Thomas of Copenhagen University, one of the world's leading experts in mammal hair. And uh, the DNA from it was very fragmented, but going on the scale arrangement and the internal structure of the hair, he said that uh, it is related to the Sumatran orangutan, but it's not the Sumatran orangutan. And he's forced to conclude that there is a large unknown primate uh, on Sumatra. Do you think that if, um, if you take a Rang Pandek, you take the Almasti, Bigfoot, Sasquatch, Yeti, all the cousins in that family, that a albeit convergently evolved entire branch of 
of, of spatial evolution can exist without yet being properly found. Um, you know, rank pendek can exist in an environment which is so remote and so vast that there's a high chance that it can exist. Um, Bigfoot, um, I heard um, Jeff Meldrum speaking and he was saying that there's almost, it's almost a certainty to him that Bigfoot could exist in the Pacific Northwest of, of, of the United States, for example, given the terrain, given what is currently known in inverted commas about the species. But do you think that all those cousins on that branch could all exist and not any of them be found yet? Certainly some of them. Um, for instance, the Yeti. Consistent descriptions of the Yeti going back thousands of years into ancient books in Asia. Um, it's not white, it's a brown or reddish brown or black in colour. Um, there seems to be distinct types, a very massive one or three metres tall, uh, a, uh, a medium sized one and then a, that, that will lope along on all fours rather than walk erect. And then a smaller one similar to the Orang Pendek. Then you've got the Yeren in China, which seems very similar to the, the larger kind of Yeti. And the places that they are living are so remote and vast. And with the, the Chinese Yeti, the Yeren, once again, they've got hair from it that has defied analysis. Uh, it's from a primate, but the makeup of it is not from any known primate. And more recently with the Yeti, they've got environmental DNA or eDNA, which was taken from a couple of years ago from a pool in the mountains of Bhutan where animals have been drinking and a British vet and a French geneticist did this expedition took some samples they found that there was a very rare type of um, wild sheep there that they didn't, quite, didn't realize in how it inhabited the area but they also got primate DNA and uh, whatever it was shared about 98 percent of its DNA with humans so the there was a primate drinking from that pool that was as closely related to human beings as a chimpanzee is. And the nearest known apes to there are in Sumatra and Borneo. So that's a stunning piece of evidence. Now, I contacted this geneticist and she said she wasn't able to do any more work on it because she didn't have the time or the funds and she no longer worked for the company that had these samples. And I've tried to find out whether these samples are still in existence and get them over to my colleagues at Copenhagen to get them um, looked at. But so far, I've, I've just hit a dead end. And you would think with something like that, something as important as that, that's you know, potentially world-shaking, there would be more interest in it. But there isn't. Do you think it's there? being deliberately blocked? I don't think it's been deliberately blocked. I think it's just apathy. I'll tell you. I'll tell you why I think it's apathy. Because, because the last expedition I did, I went to Tajikistan in Central Asia to look for a relic hominin called the Gul, G U L, and I met a lot of people that claimed to have seen this creature there, including a biology teacher that was actually attacked by one of them, but also. We heard stories about the Caspian tiger, which was a subspecies of tiger that's supposed to have died out in the 1960s. But we met dozens of people that had seen them. They'd seen females with cubs. They'd see there'd been hunters who had shot wild goats and had them stolen by the tiger. Uh, it take come in, taken livestock from farms. We met a park ranger who had seen one just a month before we were there and observed it from only about 100 feet away. So I wrote up all of these sightings into one piece and I sent this all to every single tiger conservation group I could find online um, saying, look, I was in this area, I've heard these stories and one of these guys was a park warden that had seen one. I'm just giving you this information to see if you're interested in it. And the silence was deafening. Given the certainly increasing recently global push for conservation of, you know, all aspects of our planet, flora, fauna, you'd think that if something like this, certainly if there are more than one, 
um, branch of this evolved species exist on the planet. The, the first road of conservation is at least trying to figure out whether these things exist. And they may well. And if they do, they're going to be amongst the largest predators, if, you, if they are predators, but it's certainly amongst the, the largest creatures on our planet. Why would we not be desperately trying to find them? I mean, we are, but why, why as, a, as a people are, are we not? The Russians, in the 1950s, the Russians took it seriously. They had something called the Snowman Commission uh, that was based at the Darwin Museum in Moscow. Uh, it was headed up by Boris Prizhnev, who was a famous Russian scientist. And it had a, a, a number of so very well-respected um, scientists, Marie Jean Kaufman, um, Peter Smolin, and the, the commission was in existence for a number of years. They took it that seriously. It was officially wound down, but they carried on meeting, and now it's just been reinstated, the Snowman Commission. There's a Snowman Commission in Russia again to look for these things, but why the hell people don't take it more seriously, I find it baffling. Absolutely, and frustrating. Trying to get backing for any of this is like trying to bang your head against a brick wall. I mean, I've tried to get television interested in it for years and years and years with very little, very, very little success. It all comes down to the green folding stuff. It all comes down to, to money. I mean, when I go on these expeditions, I, I go for like two or three weeks, but really you should be going like for months or, or years looking for these things. There's so much I want to do, um, and I just don't have the funding for it. And that's why I try and get television interested in it, but no one, no one seems to want to know. It would make a fabulous television series. If you can you imagine something with a budget like Life on Earth that took cryptozoology seriously and took its time to try and find these things, um, and instead of, I mean, there's a lot of these shows that are just completely sensational, like mounting monsters and that sort of nonsense, where they're not interested in finding the creature. They're just interested in, in watching a bunch of hillbillies mess about in the woods. But Life on Earth is a perfect example of, I mean, BBC World, that, that, the work they do is absolutely sensational. It's, uh, it's breathtaking to watch. But those shows are five, six, seven years in the making, you know, to get the footage that they get. Um, they've got people out there. If you watch, you know, the little bits at the end, the making of segments at the end, they're going out, some of them, year after year after year to try and get the specific moment where the, you know, the, the lion does this or the whale does that. You know, it takes years of, of work to get whatever it might be, to see a specific behavior or... You know, and this in, these are in animals that are often tagged and tracked, so... In the past, I've had people say, oh, well, well you must guarantee we can find the animal. <laughs> How can I, I do that? That's ridiculous. And another time, a, uh, a company um, contacted me, and it was uh, a series called Jane Golding Investigates. It's... Um, I had this series investigating things like mediums and psychics and ghosts and stuff and all of that. And they came to me and said, we want to do a second series, but we want to make it more science-based, but we haven't got a big budget, so it'll have to be in Europe or Britain. I said, have you got anything we could do? And I said, yes, you could investigate the idea that lake monsters are in fact huge eels, because the European eel lives in fresh water, when it gets ready to breed, it goes out to the Sargasso Sea, breeds and dies. Babies return to the ancestral waters. Uh, one theory is that they follow scent trails. The other theory is that they, they navigate by uh, magnetic fields. But they, the, the youngsters come back to the ancestral waters and the cycle goes around again. It was a theory that sometimes some eels become uh, sterile but they don't sexually develop because all eels have no sexual organs uh, until they reach a certain age. And this can differ in different parts of the world and in different areas. When they, they do reach sexual maturity, then they grow the sexual organs when they move out to the sea. But they're all completely sterile in, when, when they're in fresh water. Uh, the, the idea that there are some that never, ever grow sexual organs, and we call them unit eels, and they stay in fresh water, getting bigger and bigger 
and older and older. Nobody knows how big they can get. But in 2004, some Canadian tourists reported seeing an eel 25 feet long in Loch Ness, which makes much more sense than some sort of prehistoric monster. And I said, what we could do, we could have uh, Hessian sacks, permeable sacks filled with bait uh, underneath, uh, sort of dried blood, fish meal, stuff like that, and attach them to these boys with the sack underneath. And then if something grabs a hold of the sack and is strong enough to pull the boy underwater, you know, there's something bigger in the lake than should be. You might be able to get close enough to get some film on it. And this researcher who contacted me said, oh, that's brilliant. That's a wonderful idea. It's so good. It's really exciting. I'll get back to the producer and then I'll, I'll be back to you within two weeks. He got back to us and says, the producer doesn't want to do it because it's too real. It's too much like natural history. It's nothing to do with alien abductions or guardian angels. What a load of shit. What a load of shit. But that's the point. That's the whole frigging point. But people in the media are second only to right-wing politicians as being lying, stupid, nasty, self-serving turds. Yeah, true. it's the Hollywood effect, isn't it? As you say, it's the green folding stuff and it's looking at what's going to get the biggest, the biggest impact, what's going to hit the headlines and I guess eunuch eels probably aren't versus, you know, trying to prove it's a dinosaur, for example. Well, my, my colleague John Downs and his friend Graham years and years ago uh, they uh, did a documentary about the chupacabra in mexico and uh, puerto rico and i don't actually think that thing exists i think it's more of a media creation and uh, john's pretty much the same as well but they weren't really interested in investigations they were more interested in in um, sticking a, a six foot seven bloke who weighs 24 stone in a tiny little car and laughing at it and, and struggling to get out and things. They were not interested in investigation. That's something that certainly, you know, obviously we're, we're a paranormal show, so I'm spe I speak to people who are involved in extraterrestrial research, who are involved in spirit research, in mediumship, and, you and um, the conversation comes up repeatedly, and it has done on this show, and it has done on previous episodes, of Hollywood I call it Hollywood, but, you know, TV and the media, just interfering in people's legitimate work, or me, or be a lot of it's pseudoscience. Um, but it is people who have invested their life and invested their money and all their time in researching X and looking for maybe a little bit of help and Hollywood coming along and saying, there's, there's no bang for the book. And that's why if you look at a lot of these, for example, ghost hunter shows that are on now, there's ghosts walking past in every single episode. If you speak to anyone who researches this for a living, they'll say there isn't. You go hours, days, weeks, months without kind of getting anything because that's the nature of the beast. You can't get something in every episode. You know, if you go out on the Bigfoot hunt, you're not going to get wood knocks and howls every night. But somehow the TV show has the wood knocks and the growls and the howls every night you know and i'm not accusing anybody of anything but it's a that's that's what the television companies demand isn't it they want they want the entertainment factor and actually the legitimate research is not that, that's why I, I, we need to do it as a natural history show not as an entertainment show do you find and I'm taking you deliberately left field here. Do you find having obviously researched all of it, that there's any argument to, to some of these animals, cryptids, not being physical and there being any sort of um, spiritual or extraterrestrial or occult, you know, existence to any of these things? Obviously you will have encountered that, I'm sure, many times, certainly from a folkloric perspective because in a lot of these countries the animal is is seen as maybe something spiritual for example do you do you see there's any argument to to any of that all, all of my investigations everything from the russian almasty to the giant anaconda everyone's thought that they were animals they were just 
animals, okay. or in the case of so the Almaster, I think it's a wild man. There's a taboo against shooting it because they recognise it as maybe not Homo sapiens, but like something very close. Uh, but, and indeed, it, some of the witnesses I've spoken to us that they're confused with why scientists want to come all the way from England to Russia or wherever to look for something that they just take uh, as red. But for the instance, the, the Almas, they, they accept it in the same way as they accept bears and wolves and wild boars and lynx, which is slightly rarer. But if you're talking about non-physical things, or, well, they're physical because they, they have, they interact with the world, they have physical traces, but they're not standard zoology. I think for that, you've got to be looking at things like Owl Man, Moth Man, things like that. Um, I, mean, I, I know uh, an Owl Man witness. Well, for years, I thought it was a European Eagle Owl. You get them in Britain, they're rare, but you do get them in Britain. They're a huge six foot across the wings, they can kill small deer and wild cats. So, I think that's what someone was saw. Well, the people that saw them, they weren't expecting to see such a huge owl in a Cornish graveyard and it scared the pants off them. I met one of, one of his witnesses, and I still know him today, and he's now a very well-respected scientist. He works in the field of natural history. He's very well-respected. And, you know, obviously, he doesn't want his name getting out, but he saw it when he was about 13 or 14, and I talked to him about it, and he said it was definitely not an owl. They said it makes no sense as an animal. Uh, rather than a beak, it got this gaping mouth. It had claws on its wings, which no modern bird has. It was as big as a person. The legs bent backward like a bird, but instead of claws, it had like crab-like pincers that it was holding the tree with. It makes no evolutionary or biological sense whatsoever. And it terrified him. And he was haunted by nightmares about it for years afterwards. And he felt that somehow it had followed him home, this entity, and it was looking up into his bedroom from the woods outside of his house. And he was, he was having all these nightmares. And to this day, he still is very, very, gets very, very frightened when he, he remembers it. There's a case from a, a place called Oconto Falls. I think it's 2007, I think, I believe it happened. Um, and that's in, uh, I believe, Wisconsin in the States. And there are multiple witness sightings of uh, what can only be described as an actual dragon. Four legs, two wings, gigantic size, reptilian, white. They said it was it was a sort of a, a its scales were white rather than green or red. Or anything. They said it was white and fireball coming from its mouth, not a jet of flame like you see in films, but a ball of fire. Now, if those things were around as all the time as flesh and blood creatures, they'd be attacking planes and turning up on radar and sure terrifying people all over the world so what is it is it something that slips through from another dimension is it a, a subconscious gestalt torpa from from the the, the, you know, the hive mind of, of humanity if you look at, at monsters throughout cultures you'll you'll get what i call the, the global monster template in every culture you get dragons or monster reptiles You'll get monstrous birds, uh, monstrous cats, monstrous dogs, little people, goblins, fairies and things, and hairy giants. And you'll get them in all cultures. And it's got a weird analogue with what our astrophysicine ancestors would have been facing uh, on the plains of um, East Africa a couple of million years ago when they were coming down out of the forest to it exploit new food, food sources like carrion. They'd have been preyed on by crocodiles and pythons, uh, large eagles like the Marshall Eagle took them down, leopards and lions took them, African hunting dogs took them, and they would have been uh, in competition with other species of astro astrophyticine and other primates, some bigger, some smaller. There were giant baboons, there were robust astrophyticines that were bigger than our own ancestors, and there was smaller primates as well so it's as if all of the monsters in folklore are, are these, these sort of weird echoes of these things that may have been passed down the fears of, of them may have been passed down genetically from millions of years ago 
That's absolutely fascinating. And do you know, Richard, that's not anything I've ever heard before. Um, I mean, so... You're familiar with the idea of tulpas, aren't you? And um, yeah, sure. under course. intense concentration, you can create a um, something that other people can see, uh, an almost physical thing that other people. People like um, Franek Plusky, he materialised animals at sittings, and they were huge dogs and birds, massive birds that would sit on his head, and uh, like so much night jars, and uh, an ape-like creature. Shambling, it was almost as if he was tapping into this subconscious, um, gestalt mind uh, of humanity. And Dame Alexandra David Neal, who's a French woman uh, who became a Tibetan Lama, she said she created a, a, a thought form of a monk which thought to become independent of her own mind, but other people saw it and thought it was just a, a monk following her entourage. Now, if people can do that individual people can do that under intense training what could the whole of humanity do subconsciously there's these fears that have been brought down two million years through time from east africa could they create some of these things that that would have a physical presence for even if it was just for a short amount of time which is it would explain how things can turn up scare a bunch of people and then seemingly vanish again, often in places that couldn't um, physically support such a creature. Yeah, sure. Nonetheless, our own, uh, our own little island. Well, we don't. We know that, that there are exotic cats in Britain. They've been captured. There's a puma captured in Scotland. Jungle cats have been captured. Lynxes have been captured. We know they're out there. I've seen a, a puma in Devon, and I've also seen a kill in, up in North Devon of a sheep where it had its neck dislocated, the skin peeled back as if you were skin, peeling back the skin of a, a banana or a kipper, and then the bones very neatly picked uh, of, uh, of flesh, and the, uh, uh, the most of the organs gone as well. That looks to me like it was a, a cat, a big cat. It's uh, similar to kills I've seen in Africa. Would a cat have done it with, with precision? Would a cat not have gone straight in the side to the organs? Would it have peeled the skin back? Oh yes, their tongues are covered with little rasping... Um, if you look at them very, under the microscope, you'll see little spines on a cat's tongue and it uses them for rasping the meat off. And they, they kill by dislocation of the neck bones or by suffocation. And a uh, dog kills are quite messy because dogs bite at the legs of an animal and the flanks of an animal and bring it down that way and worry it and savage it to death. And it, there's, there's fur everywhere. This was much more clinical. And dogs will also snap the bones, they'll crunch the bones up in their jaws, which cats seldom do. Uh, they'll take the flesh and rasp the flesh off the bones and take the organ. They very rarely crunch up the bones. And just a few miles away, a few years later, fur was found that was identified again by Lars Thomas as positively coming from a leopard. I'll tell you a great story, well, a great scary story. There's lakes in Siberia where there are supposed to be creatures that are attacking and killing people. There's a lake called Lake Chani in southern Siberia. And over the past 10 years or so, 19 people have been killed by something in a lake which witnesses say is serpentine and about 30 feet long. They say it rams and flips boats, grabs people, kills them. One guy was fishing with his mate, whatever this thing was, ran the boat, flipped it over, grabbed his mate, he made it to shore, never saw his mate again. Another instance, a, uh, a grandmother was watching her grandson, a former soldier, fishing in the lake. The creature ran the lake, ran the, the boat, he found the water, it grabbed him, never saw him again. And occasionally chunks of carcass wash upon the floor that have been chewed and that was wash upon the shore and that they've been chewed by some huge animal um, they asked for an official investigation and the russian government said people are just getting drunk and drowning and that sounds like it sounds like a freshwater jaws it's like a, the, the plot to a horror novel and that other lakes lake verota and lake uh, lavanica in um, eastern Siberia, where similar things are happening now, lake chani has got towns and villages around it so it happens more often but these more remote lakes the nomads say that they've had 
rafts flipped by something that, that killed people and they've chased deer into the lakes and something's come up and grabbed the deer and pulled them under. Um, no one has gone to investigate this and once again I've tried to get TV interested in doing a documentary about the killer lake monsters of Siberia. What are they? Are they giant eels, giant catfish? What, what the hell are they? Nobody knows. The lake Lavanika, uh, there were some Russian scientists went there and they got a huge, something huge swimming on their sonar. And the, the Lake Lavanika is incredibly deep. Lake Chang is very, very shallow, but Lake Lavanika is incredibly deep. I'd love to uh, open a bottle of wine and ask you questions for the next four hours, but unfortunately, <laughs> I'm uh, not permitted to do so. A couple of weeks ago, I went down to London and met up with a load of other Forteans, including some folks that have been on, on past expeditions, and we just sat in the pub all night for about seven hours just drinking and talking and cryptozoology. Yeah. Okay. It's, um, I mean, the, the, the beautiful thing about yourself is you have a scientific, biological, zookeeper background, but your mind's open to, to, you know, whatever that next level is. So, you know, sometimes you find somebody who's big into the cryptozoological, but they're focusing a lot more on the paranormal, supernatural aspect of it, which is obviously, as, to me, also fascinating. But you need a grounding in science. Speak the cryptozoology on. is purely the science of hidden animals. They don't have to be big or frightening. They could be like the, the ivory bill woodpecker of um, Cuba and the southern United States, thought to be extinct, might still be out there. That's a cryptid, every bit as much as a sea serpent. Yeah, sure. Well, you're absolutely fascinating. As I say, yes. I would love to, uh, to talk more. Um, Let's get this stupid pandemic nonsense out of the way, get you some funding, and then we will, um, we will speak again. Okay, thanks for having me, yeah. No Let problem, it's been an absolute good. pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on, it's been an absolute pleasure to, uh, to speak with you, really oh, appreciate it. It's been great, yeah. Thanks. Peer Beyond the Veil has been written and presented by myself, Mark Watson, as part of the Fearscape Media Network. Music and soundtracks are credited and licensed to Purple Planet and to Kevin MacLeod, licensed under Creative Commons. All rights are reserved by our parent company, MLW Publishing. You can follow us at facebook.com forward slash Peer Beyond the Veil or on Twitter at Peer Beyond the Veil or at Peer Beyond 2020. Please click the like and subscribe buttons when you see them, most importantly wherever you listen to your podcasts. It helps us to attract the attention we need to keep the show going, to get the guests that you all want to hear from, and to help more and more people peer beyond the veil.